Okay, good evening, welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Um, welcome to Cafe Scientifique, Silicon Valley at SRI International. I'm Alice Resnick, a Vice President of Corporate and Marketing Communications for SRI, and we've been hosting the Science Cafe for several years now, quite a few years actually, and, and um, I see some familiar faces, so thanks for coming here this evening, and we appreciate that you're all here tonight instead of watching the World Series. So. Uh-oh, don't let him leave. <laughs> okay. Um, tonight we have, a, um, we have a special science cafe this evening. We've joined forces with the Bay Area Science Festival, and uh, we have a representative from the festival here tonight, Jen. She's in the back, and she'll she'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the festival, and we've got some flyers about it um, on your chairs here. It's really a terrific event. It's a 10-day long event. Um, it culminates Saturday in AT&T Park in San Francisco and also at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds. And in AT&T Park alone on Saturday, they will be, um, they're expecting about 30,000 people for some wonderful family-friendly exhibits and demonstrations and shows. And it's just a really, really fun, terrific event. So I encourage you to attend. Um, and let's see, our next cafe speaker won't be until January 13th, I believe, but we have an amazing speaker with us on that evening um, as well. Uh, virologist Nathan Wolf from Stanford will present viral forecasting for pandemic pre prevention, which certainly is a timely topic. Um, Dr. Wolf has been called the Indiana Jones of virus hunting. So he's going to talk about how viruses enter the human population from animals and can become pandemics. Timely, Timely correct. And as a reminder, our cafe events are posted on SRI's YouTube channel, so you can watch them afterwards or share them um, with other folks. So on to tonight's topic, which is concussions in sports. Our esteemed panel will tell the story of standout NHL player Derek Bogard, whose concussions and injuries mounted over his career. And they'll talk about the latest science and technology used to diagnose and detect such injuries and what that might mean for the future of sports. The panel will be introduced and moderated by Katie Baker, a writer for Grantland.com, and uh, then they'll take questions at the end. So please do use the microphones that'll be in the aisles so that everyone can hear your question and we can have that on the YouTube um, recording. Uh, Kepler's Books is here this evening. I'm selling uh, uh, copies of the books if you're interested and in afterwards. And um, so now let's welcome our panel. Um, again, here we have Katie Baker from Grantland.com. She's going to introduce all of our speakers. John Branch, author of the book Boy on, Boy on Ice, The Life and Death of Derek Bogard, and professors David Camarillo and Joel Kramer. So let's welcome them and get on. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Baker. I'm a staff writer at Grantland, which is part of ESPN. Um, and uh, I started writing for them in 2011. Um, and my first assignment was to cover the NHL. Um, and right when I started working there, um, there was a, a tragic um, uh, incident in the NHL community. There are actually, actually several kind of all at around the same time um, in which former players and in some cases current players um, had bad concussion and post-concussion um, syndrome related brain damage that um, in, in the case of player Derek Bogard led to um, his demise at a very young age. Um, and it, you know, anyone who has followed the NFL for the last few years knows that Concussions have also become um, a huge topic in that sport as well, and um, it's just something that's really at the forefront of in the sports universe um, where I work. But um, we're excited today to be here with um, people who are also on the other side of that, um, not just covering the sports aspect of it, but um, are the the doctors who are you know looking into the brain and examining what happens, um, you know, what the impacts of repeated brain trauma can be, and then also people who are actually um, helping to figure out how you even can measure 
what, what a concussion is and what a hit is. Um, so we're excited to be here today with everyone. I'm just going to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have John Branch here, the author of Boy on Ice, which, as you saw, um, is available out in the lobby. Um, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. John is a Pulitzer Prize-winning sports reporter for the New York Times. Um, and like I said, this is his book. We have next to him Dr. David Camarillo, the assistant professor of bioengineering and mechanical engineering at Stanford University. And finally, Dr. Joel Kramer, professor of neuropsychology and neurology and director of the Memory and Aging Center Neuropsychology Program at UC San Francisco. Um, so I'd like to start by just having everyone um, talk a little bit about the work that you've done over the last you know, a few years and how it, you know, as it relates to the topic of concussions in sports, and then we can go from there. Start with me? Yeah, we'll start with John. Um, thanks. Um, mostly I have worked on this book about Derek Bogard. Uh, it stemmed from a three-part series that I wrote for the New York Times in 2011 and um, decided to turn that series into a book. But obviously, concussions are a huge issue. I wrote a concussion story today, actually, um, that will probably run tomorrow in the New York Times uh, about high school kids. An issue that's not going away, and I have colleagues such as Alan Schwartz who um, have written a lot of stories and really broke, I think, a lot of ground journalistically about concussions and the impact they have on sports. Alan's stories are mostly about the NFL, um, but I think without Alan, a lot of this attention on concussions wouldn't exist today. So, thank you. Again, I'm David Camarillo um, from uh, Stanford Bioengineering Department. Uh, the work that my lab has been doing on, uh, on concussions is on the measurement side. Um, and we're trying to understand what are the forces that are involved that are causing concussion. Uh, concussion is a very uh, tricky scientific uh, subject of inquiry, um, as you'll, you'll hear, I'm sure, from Dr. Kramer, that there's you know, not even good definitions in terms of you know, what are the cognitive symptoms that are associated with concussion, and much less do we know how the physical forces, this is a physical injury, uh, translate into any kind of neurological deficit. So you know, we've been instrumenting athletes uh, at, at Stanford, uh, football players, some other sports. We've also you know, dabbled, uh, not quite yet in hockey, but in um, uh, mixed martial arts, boxing, and instrumented these athletes with uh, mouth guards that have sensors inside of them so can measure the accelerations uh, that their head sustains uh, during trauma. And we want to try to connect that to, to the neurological deficits. And, uh, and this is really just in the very early stages, kind of immediately uh, surrounding an injury. But the bigger questions that we haven't started to get at at all, maybe Dr. Kramer can speak to more, is what are the long-term implications? Is this causing brain long-term brain damage? And, and when does that start? Um, so again, I'm Joel Kramer. I'm with the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF, and the Memory and Aging Center has a few missions, but two of them are to provide you know, state-of-the-art clinical care for our patients. Um, and the second is to maintain a very active research program at multiple levels so that we can not only understand and diagnose these, these disorders better, but also you know, push forward new treatments. And uh, you know, so we study neurodegenerative diseases, and it's become increasingly clear that multiple repetitive uh, traumatic brain injury can be associated with a neurodegenerative disease later on in life. So um, in our uh, approach to trying to, to understand this better, you know, well, first of all, you know, there are a few of us who are members of an NFL, uh, the Head, Neck, and Spine subcommittee to try and understand this better. We are one of the NFL's you know, original six neurology care centers. So we see a lot of uh, you know, retired football players who come in to our clinic for assessment of the symptoms that you know, are, you know, are typically associated with the many neurodegenerative disorders that we see. And we are now enrolling them in, into our research. And uh, we, you know, we also have a big proposal going out in the next couple of days to the NIH to again, try and you know, study this, this phenomenon in a, an empirical and fair way. Okay, so um, I'd like to start a little bit by just talking about Derek Bogard as, um, and, and why he's in some ways a, a case study for the confluence of 
um, of sports and the, the medical implications of concussions and repeated trauma. Um, I'll let John talk a little bit more about it, but um, Derek Bogard is, you know, what, whether you know hockey or not, you probably have heard the joke, you know, I went to the fight last night and the hockey game broke out. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely the one sport where um, there's players on teams whose job it is is to punch people in the face and not only do they not get suspended for that, they, you know, they go off the ice to a standing ovation in many cases. So um, it's definitely a sport where um, that has this kind of unique um, role that doesn't exist in other sports. Um, of course, now knowing what we know, that role is kind of coming into question a little bit more. Um, and there's a little bit of a struggle between the culture of hockey and, you know, what we are learning about what it means to get punched in the head over and over. Um, so, John, I, I'd like to, you know, hear a little bit about what you learned and, and about Derek Bogard, who he was, um, how he came to have um, this sort of role and, you yeah. know. Um, so Derek Bogard was a, a kid that grew up in Saskatchewan, grew into a almost six foot eight, um, two hundred and sixty pound guy. Wow! Uh, when he was fifteen years old, he was not a very good hockey player, but he played on some of the top teams in small town Saskatchewan because of his size. He was bigger than just about everybody else, and he was um, discovered one night in um, the small rink in in Melfort, Saskatchewan, by some scouts who, he, unbeknownst to him, were, were watching other kids. And Derek, for some reason, against um, typecast, he was a very kind of quiet, mild, meek, shy, awkward kind of kid, um, against sort of his, his own personality, kind of went crazy on the ice and started beating up other kids on the other team. His team was losing badly, and he started shoving them, and fights broke out, and pretty soon they couldn't control Derek Bogard. And um, he eventually got carried off the ice after he had gone into the opposing team's bench. His parents were aghast, of course, and um, they thought he had you know, humiliated the family name. And they didn't realize that two of the scouts in the, in the arena that night, or in the little tiny rink that night, rushed off to a local motor lodge and faxed in a request to sign Derek Bogard to their team. And that's sort of how he became a, um, on the path to becoming an enforcer. Was drafted into the NHL a few years later and became one of the fiercest and probably the most feared guy in the NHL for about five or six years. Um, fast forward version then is that he was found dead in his apartment in Minneapolis at the age of 28 with an overdose of oxycodone, the prescription painkiller, and alcohol. And um, we came onto the story because shortly thereafter, his family <coughs> had said that they donated his brain to science um, to the folks at Boston University who had done a lot of the examinations of former NHL or NFL players. And so that's how the story came to me, was to see what we could find out about Derek. How does a 28-year-old guy, toughest guy in, the, in hockey, die of an overdose? Um. And I want to read a... Accidental overdose, I should say. Yeah. I want to read a short passage from John's book that I think is um, sort of illustrative of um, where, where some of these other considerations come in. Um, so this is kind of near the end of his life and his, his career. Um, he had been, had you know, many concussions through the years. He had knocked people out with one punch. He had been knocked out himself. Um, and, you know, every time he went to a doctor, they asked him, how many times have you had a concussion? And he'd say, you oh, know, a, a few. Um, and so here's the passage. They say, Derek soon told a story to friends about a doctor asking him his history of concussions. Derek had no idea how many he had suffered. A few, probably. The doctor framed the question differently. How many times would you say, have you been struck in the head and everything went dark, if only for a moment. Five, ten, no one had ever defined a concussion that way to Derek. He laughed. Try hundreds, he said. So, um, you know, that brings me to, um, you know, to ask the two of you, um, you know, what, what do we know about this sustained, um, these repeated head traumas? Um, you know, I know that at your hospital, um, you see athletes that come in at various stages of their career presenting themselves with symptoms. So, you know, how, how does that manifest? What do you see? What, what patterns are there? Well, first of all, we don't know all that much. Um, but in our studies, um, you know, we've uh, sort of recently reviewed all of our cases and 
try to see if there are any common threads. And you know, at this point, we think that there might be three different phenotypes or kinds of presentations. And I should say that the group in, at Boston University have talked about two different phenotypes. Um, so again, these things are being worked out. Uh, one phenotype is a player who is now in his 60s or 70s. And only in the last five, six years is starting to show some symptoms. They tend to be more cognitive rather than behavioral. Um, but they're progressive. And at first blush, they can come into clinic and look not unlike a patient who has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but when you do some experimental neuroimaging where you can actually measure the protein in the brain that we associate with Alzheimer's disease, the scan's negative. So we're now beginning to think that you know, this is a subgroup of old athletes who've had multiple repetitive head traumas um, who might have, look like Alzheimer's, but it's something different. And I should say, when you talk to these players about concussions, they very rarely report concussions with loss of consciousness, but they do say, I've had my bell rung more times than I can count. Um, so that's one phenotype. Another phenotype are players who tend to be a little bit younger. Um, there's still a long gap between the years that they played and their onset of their symptoms. And these folks might be in their 40s or 50s. And the presentation tends to be a little bit more behavioral. So these are uh, players who might have some problems with substance abuse, some problems with mood. There's a tremendous a lot, um, amount of depression. There can be irritability, angry outbursts. And these are the sorts of symptoms that were characteristic of some of the first players who showed up and were identified as having chronic traumatic encephalopathy on autopsy. You know, players, some of the Pittsburgh Steeler players who died in the 2000s who uh, you know, eventually went to autopsy. Um, the third phenotype is something that I think fits Derek more. And I think this is maybe the, the least common, which are even younger players who've actually never, act, never resolved. So this is more of a chronic post-concussive syndrome. So I mean, after mild traumatic brain injury, most of us will have irritability, concentration problems, headaches, sensitivity to light, lots of, you know, this, a host of symptoms that they refer to as a post-concussive syndrome, and it typically resolves. But if you're getting multiple, constant, ongoing uh, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, these symptoms don't resolve. They get worse and you know, tend to be a little bit more chronic. Uh, we tend to not see these folks in our clinic very often. We are much more likely to see the ones who were symptom-free for a number of years after their playing years. And, uh, and it, it seems to me like, you know, even with the, the players you see who might be in their 40s and 50s, it's probably difficult because a lot of the symptoms that you're saying are also the symptoms of being a post-professional athlete, you know? You're depressed maybe, you maybe have kind of um, substance abuse problems because you've spent your whole life being an athlete and suddenly you don't have that. So um, is, do you find that, or do you find that they have found it difficult where maybe people don't take it seriously or they think, oh, that's just, oh, you just need a hobby or, you know, not, oh, you actually are exhibiting signs of, of physical your point about these symptoms being very common in retired players is an excellent one. We did a um, survey. We had a couple of hundred retired players fill out questionnaires. And almost all of them reported problems with headaches, problems with sleep. Now, a lot of these guys might have sleep apnea because they're big mm -hmm. and you're more at risk for sleep apnea. And that can cause a lot of the same behavioral symptoms that we've been describing. So. It's hard to know when one of these players comes in with a set of symptoms what's causing it. Odds are they're multifactorial, which I think has made getting any kind of clarity about this chronic traumatic encephalopathy that much more challenging. 